He's traveled throughout Europe and, in fact, gave a version of this lecture while teaching in SRJC's Semester in Florence program two years ago. For those of you who are lucky enough to want to go to Paris this spring, Scott will be teaching this spring in Paris, France through SRJC's Study Abroad program and intends to take a student tour of um, the critical tour of the Da Vinci Code sites. So it's my pleasure to announce, uh, to introduce Scott <laughs> Fuller. Great, and thanks the Da Vinci much, Code. Carrie. Okay, again, uh, uh, following up on what Carrie said, I'd like to uh, uh, begin by inviting you uh, uh, to uh, join me in Paris um, to continue your studying of, uh, of Leonardo, that we are going to uh, do a Leonardo tour of the Louvre. Uh, the Vinci Code tour of Paris and the tour of the Loire Valley uh, and visit Ambois where Leonardo died and is, is buried. So if you have any interest in the Paris program, um, when you leave, there are brochures here and there are brochures over there. Um, first, let me thank the uh, Arts and Lectures Committee uh, for allowing me to uh, share Leonardo uh, with you. Um, I'd also like to thank some of the people that helped me put this presentation together. Uh, my student Tony Hoffman and the SRJC librarians for tracking down and acquiring some really hard to get hold of documents. Uh, my colleagues Jill Kelly Moore who let me read her uh, wonderful paper on Leonardo. Uh, Sharon Bergeron for her stimulating ideas on artistic creativity. Uh, Will Beatty and Mary Pierce for allowing me to stay with them in Florence last spring while I was doing research and Kathleen Kramer for her excellent critiques of uh, this presentation. Actually, my, my interest in Leonardo goes back uh, not 10 years. The, my scholarship goes back about 10 years. My interest goes back 45 years when I was a uh, kid in Europe and um, I went to the uh, Louvre for the first time and uh, I, saw the, uh, I saw the Mona Lisa. Um, let me try this thing out. Okay, I saw the, uh, the Mona Lisa. And in those days, one could uh, not have to stand in line, and one could spend as much time as one wants. Today, I'll show you some pictures. The lines are horrendous, the wait is horrible, and most people don't even look at the picture as they, uh, as they walk by it. Um, this, uh, this lecture is, uh, is based on uh, a set of lectures I gave in, uh, in Florence, and is an elaboration of, uh, of those lectures. Uh, and those lectures occurred before the Da Vinci Code. How many of you read the Da Vinci Code, by the way? Okay, the, the problem in this lecture is going to be we have a mixed audience. Some of you have read the Da Vinci Code, some of you haven't. Some of you know about Leonardo, some of you don't. So this is one of those things that's uh, uh, a little bit about uh, the, uh, uh, the cooks and the soup and uh, how many ingredients you want to add. So I'm going to try to cover a lot of bases and that's going to require me to go pretty quickly uh, uh, through the material. And at the end of this, hopefully what I've done is that I've, uh, I've whet your appetite uh, for finding out more about Leonardo. Uh, if you walk away and you go, God, I'd like to read more about this guy, uh, then I, in fact, have, uh, have done what I've, uh, I've set out to do. For me, Leonardo is like a, um, a giant projective test. Um, Every time I come back to him, I see something new. Uh, as my understandings of psychology, of the world, of art, of history, of science change, so do my understandings of Leonardo. So for me, this is simply sharing with you a, uh, a work in progress and uh, uh, my current thinking. And hopefully all of you, as you become interested in Leonardo, uh, will find your own uh, 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 paths uh, through, uh, through this material. What we're going to do in this lecture is basically um, take a brief, very brief look at Leonardo's life, look at how Leonardo is depicted in the Da Vinci Code, then use the Mona Lisa as the key to looking at what I will call Leonardo's Code. Very different than Da Vinci Code, but it will be uh, our entry into how to begin to think about Leonardo. That will take us in looking at Leonardo's relationship to mathematics, why he's on almost everyone's genius list, uh, 
Well, then look at Freud's analysis of Leonardo. And um, it's a fascinating analysis, and it turns out to be completely wrong from a historical standpoint. But it's a good way to raise certain questions then about what were the origins of Leonardo's uh, creativity. And then, uh, then hopefully, if I can uh, keep myself on track here, uh, I want to end with what you and I can learn uh, 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 from Leonardo about ourselves and about, uh, uh, about creativity. First, a, a brief look at uh, Leonardo's life. He's born at a very interesting period in history. For many of us, this is uh, the beginning of the modern. It's, it's, a, it's a period of time. He was born in 1452. It's a period of time that uh, uh, hallmarks the beginnings of well, what we today would recognize as a modern science. Uh, when he dies, uh, basically Galileo is born 40 years uh, later. Uh, Copernicus is uh, born when Leonardo is about uh, uh, in his 20s. Okay? It's also a period of tremendous social upheaval. Uh, uh, Martin Luther posts his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg in 1517, uh, launching the Reformation. So in fact, uh, Leonardo is born uh, on the cusp at the beginning of, uh, of this period that many of us uh, consider the, uh, the birth of the modern. Uh, he is, uh, he's born outside Vinci in a little hamlet called uh, Anchiano. Uh, this is the house that he was born in. The records pretty much substantiate that uh, today. Um, his family, somewhere in the 1450s, moves into Vinci, the town of Vinci uh, proper, where he lives until uh, 1469. Why it's important to understand Vinci is that it's a very picturesque uh, uh, Tuscan town, but it is a very wonderful natural environment. And one can very easily see where Leonardo gets his interest in nature and things natural. Uh, Vinci hasn't changed that much uh, since the uh, 15th century when uh, uh, Leonardo was, uh, uh, was born. The other is how Vinci uh, inspired his art. Um, Leonardo developed a, a, a very interesting technique called sfumato, which is, uh, literally means smoke. And it's a way of providing uh, a haziness to display distance. And uh, sometimes it's called atmospheric perspective. Um, he also used sfumato, though, this blurring in uh, uh, his, uh, some of his portraiture, and particularly in the Mona Lisa. And so we're going to see an example of that. Um, and he also developed some very complex rules around how to use the color blue and various shades of blue to give you this sense of distance. Well, this is a view from uh, uh, Vinci, and you can see the sfumato naturally occurring. So uh, it's oftentimes interesting to go back and see where an artist uh, grew up uh, to understand uh, certain aspects of their, uh, of their art and their work. Uh, in uh, 1470, he moved to Florence, lived in Florence, moved away from Florence, came back to Florence, uh, was uh, apprenticed to the uh, great sculptor Verrocchio, and uh, then in 1482 moved to Milano, where he worked for the uh, Duke of Milan, Ludovico Sforza. In that period, he painted the Last Supper uh, at uh, Santa Maria del Grazie, which is going to be a very, very important piece of art for us to look at in terms of the Da Vinci Code. He also worked in Venice in Rome at the Vatican. And then finally, under the patronage of Francis I of uh, France, he uh, moved to Amboise, where he died in uh, 1519. Uh, his relationship with uh, Francis I was a very intimate relationship, uh, although, in fact, Francis was not present at his death. He was in another part of France. Uh, this is oftentimes displayed to uh, reflect the, uh, the intimacy of that, uh, that relationship. Upon his death, he had in his possession La Gioconda, the Mona Lisa, John the Baptist, and Saint Anne, the Virgin Mary, and Child. All three of those paintings will figure very heavily in our own understanding 
of Leonardo and who he was and uh, the nature of the Da Vinci Code. He was a copious uh, note taker, writer, and illustrator. And unfortunately for us, it's estimated that more than two thirds of his writings are gone, simply unrecoverable. Uh, every year or two, somebody will discover a fragment here and a fragment there. But what's left of his writing is, is uh, distributed in 10 different uh, codices, uh, some of which have been discovered as late as the 1980s, uh, others which go back uh, to a couple hundred years uh, after his, uh, his death. Why this is important is that though Leonardo appears on everybody's genius list, he doesn't appear on the list for the history of science and who the great scientists were. And the reason is, is that his work did not get distributed, uh, did not become part of that, uh, that world of spreading scientific culture. And now, retrospectively, we go back and we can say, well, he invented this, and he invented that, and he discovered this, and he preceded Newton by 200 years. But it did little good because his work was not available. In 2003, uh, Dan Brown uh, published the Da Vinci Code. Uh, for those of you that are Da Vinci Code fans, um, I'll try not to step on too many toes here. Dan Brown, unfortunately, made a, a, a very interesting claim. And I think the book would have been uh, received very differently if he hadn't made this claim. In the beginning of the book, it says, fact, all descriptions of artwork, architecture, documents, and secret rituals in this novel are accurate. Well, that's all you have to say to set off a maelstrom. Uh, oh, no, it's not. So we got Da Vinci Code Decoded. Yeah, on and on. I went through all these books, by the way. They're horrible, most of them. But, but, it also stimulated a renewed interest in Leonardo. And that I'm very, very thankful for. Even though Leonardo is, I think, horribly distorted in the book, uh, just like early Christianity is horribly distorted, it got people interested. It got people interested in the Gnostic Gospels again, in early Christendom, and for those of us who love Leonardo, it got people interested in uh, Leonardo. So finally, then we get the great <laughs> postmodern classic, Da Vinci for Dummies, okay? And by the way, you never call Leonardo Da Vinci because Da Vinci means of Vinci. We like calling you. Hey, of Santa Rosa, okay? So, um, and it's, by the way, it's not a bad book. So, again, you can't always tell books by their covers and all of that. What I want to do now is look at how Leonardo is uh, portrayed in the uh, Da Vinci Code. This is now for those of you that haven't read it. For those of you who had, you're going to go, yeah, but yeah, but it's more than that. Leonardo was the head of a secret society, according to the Da Vinci Code, called the Priory of Sion. The Priory of Sion protected a secret that Mary Magdalene was the wife of Jesus, and they had a child. And it goes on for the implications of that. The secret knowledge can be seen in Leonardo's Last Supper, where Mary sits, on the, sits at, not on, the right hand of Jesus. And the secret can also be seen in Leonardo's Mona Lisa, where the union of the sacred feminine with the masculine is depicted. Okay? So let's take a look. This is the Last Supper um, uh, depicting the Passover celebration before Christ was uh, captured and uh, crucified. Uh, most people think of the Last Supper in terms of the Eucharist, in terms of the Holy Communion. Uh, as we look at the Last Supper, what we're really interested in is the character John. This is not John the Baptist now. This is John the Evangelist or the Apostle John. And when we look at John closely, we go, I don't think that's John. <laughs> when we look at it really closely, we go, no, that's not John. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a girl. Now, this is a, um, a copy made not too long after the, uh, the Last Supper. And again, I wish I could spend the entire period with the Last Supper. I mean, any, any of the topic areas that we're going to cover, I'm covering so quickly and so briefly. And they deserve lots, lots more time. So again, this is to just whet your appetite. Um, but this is a, a, a copy uh, made uh, not too long after the, uh, the Last Supper was completed. And even in the copy, 
uh, without all the, uh, the degradation of time, we see a, uh, a very, a very uh, feminine face. Now, oops, go back. Now, this is the secret message of the Da Vinci Code, okay? This relationship now between Jesus and Mary Magdalene, according to the Da Vinci Code, tells us how to decode what's happening. The V between them stands for the sacred feminine, and the M that they form says both that they're married, matrimonia, and that really this is about Mary. It was amazing, as uh, friends of mine would read the Da Vinci Code, how they say, wow, I never saw that before in the Last Supper. Wow, it's really true. Wow, this is so interesting. Wow. And not only that, but, you know, a, a, a big point is made in uh, the Da Vinci Code that, in fact, uh, Mary Magdalene is the Holy Grail, or this knowledge is the Holy Grail. And they say, look it, there's no chalice here. There's, oops, there's no, there's no Grail cup an alternative story. The alternative story is this. First, the scene that's depicted is not the Eucharist, it's before. It's the uh, right before where uh, basically Jesus tells the disciples that he's about to be betrayed. And the reason that John slash Mary is leaning over towards St. Peter is that St. Peter has beckoned him over and asked him if he would ask Jesus who is the person to which he is speaking. The Last Supper exists in a tradition of Last Suppers. This is by uh, Domenico uh, Gerlandio, who was Michelangelo's teacher. And you see many of the same themes. Keep this in mind as we go back and look at Leonardo's Last Supper, uh, because Leonardo does some things that are spectacularly uh, different. What he's doing is unbelievably complex, and why people literally flooded from all over Europe uh, to see this very quickly after its completion was that he's trying to keep continuity in perspective with the room. So that as you look at the Last Supper, you're actually looking at a continuation of the, uh, of the room, including lighting that would reflect lighting coming in from windows. But at the same time with that, he's done some great optical tricks. This was in the, uh, uh, the room where the, uh, the monks in this uh, particular uh, monastery would have their, um, uh, their food. And the perspective was, what would these monks see as they're looking up at the painting. Well, if it was in true perspective with the room, they'd be looking under the table at these guys' knees. So what Leonardo did was he flipped the whole thing forward so that you're actually getting a view that looks like from slightly above, but it really looks like it's happening from down here. That is amazing. The mathematics alone in that is absolutely, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, not only that, but you notice some interesting things. If you, again, you keep the, if you can keep the Gerland dial in mind, notice all the action and movement. Leonardo was fascinated by the expression of human personality, of human emotion, and the use of the body as a means of expressing human emotion. He also had an interesting problem. He had to get 12 guys and, him, and, and Jesus around this table. So he does these very, very interesting uh, kinds of clumpings. So not only is it an interesting picture in terms of perspective, it's a fascinating picture in terms of his depiction of people, particularly given uh, what was happening in the rest of Renaissance art at the time. And here's the question being asked. This is uh, St. Peter asking John the evangelist, please ask the master. Now, we could go on about this knife and stuff, but I'm going to run out of time. So I'll just that'll be for your further, uh, further researches. Now, one of the most fascinating things that, um, that I only came across in one article um, was this actual arrangement. Why is it that, in fact, it's not symmetrical? If you notice that the orthogonal lines 
uh, are trying to, as much as possible, lead us to the figure of Jesus. Leonardo loved to use the, uh, the triangle as a structure. It had uh, interesting meanings for him. Uh, you will, we'll see the same thing in the Mona Lisa. But if you notice, the, uh, basically the, uh, the distance between the, uh, the heads of the uh, disciples on this side is much shorter than on this side. And the question always was, well, why is uh, John leaning away? Well, of course, to create that magical V, of course. No, 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 no. Leonardo was very much interested in what he uh, called, and people in Renaissance called the divine proportion, a ratio that appears over and over and over again, not in, only in nature, but in Renaissance art. And in fact, what we find is that the configuration of the, uh, the people is to create the divine proportion because the relationship between line A and line B is 1.618 if you actually sit and uh, measure it out. And I actually did, did the math on it. We also know a lot about the Last Supper from the notebooks. And particularly using the notebooks, uh, we know that he tried lots of different uh, designs. There's no mention of Mary Magdalene or anything close, but we do know he sketched uh, John a bunch of different times. Uh, and so it's pretty clear that this is John. But the, the, uh, the concluding evidence is, uh, is fairly simple, just using the kind of stuff that art historians use. Um, the key is here in the hands, the folded hands. In much of, uh, of religious art, you're given clues to who these characters are. They have certain kind of, of emblems, certain kind of symbols that always go with them. And with John the Apostle, it's the folding hands. So here we see John at the crucifixion. He was the only one of the disciples who did not, in fact, betray Jesus. We see the, uh, the folded hands. And in Leonardo's sketchbooks, we see his preparatory drawings with the folded hands. The femininity of the efface, or the androgyny of the efface, is also something very common in Renaissance art, and certainly very common in Leonardo. At the very end of the lecture, I'll return to this theme of androgyny and how we might use that to decode both Leonardo's creativity and who he was. But suffice it to say that um, androgyny was, uh, was so common that when uh, Greco-Roman myths were brought in to uh, Florence as part of this thing we call the Renaissance, meaning a rediscovery of uh, Greco-Roman times. Uh, and the myths were Christianized. The myth of uh, Ganymede uh, basically was used to uh, represent John the Evangelist, the innocent, and uh, the eagle, Jesus. So when we look at it, uh, the eagle, Jesus, uh, Ganymede, uh, uh, John the Evangelist, and again, just look at the, uh, the uh, androgyny or even femininity uh, in the face. Um, not only that, Leonardo uses androgynous figures over and over again. We see the androgyny in John the Baptist. We see it in other depictions of John uh, the Evangelist. And even in Garandilo's uh, uh, Last Supper, uh, we see a... Uh, a, a very young, a very clean-shaven uh, face. Now, the Mona Lisa. Arguably, the Mona Lisa is the most famous painting, perhaps in the world, certainly in the Western tradition. People who know nothing else about art, when they see the Mona Lisa, they go, oh, that's the Mona Lisa. So what is it about the Mona Lisa? It's the smile. And that's what becomes so interesting for us, is that smile that it has, it has confounded, it has uh, puzzled, it has, uh, has got people literally uh, from the beginning. It's reported that uh, Raffaello, uh, Raphael uh, saw the uh, uh, Mona Lisa, was brought to tears, and looking at that smile and that face influenced him uh, the rest of uh, his life. Uh, today, getting to see the Mona Lisa is, is quite a uh, process. Uh, people wait for hours in line, and uh, as they walk by, they're talking and not looking. Uh, but uh, if you go to uh, the Louvre and you want to see the Mona Lisa, uh, try to schedule a time when there's not uh, everybody 
and their brother. They've actually created a new uh, viewing port uh, for the Mona Lisa, so when I go back to Paris, I'll, uh, I'll uh, check it out. We know that Leonardo worked on this painting um, for a long time, much longer than the period that's reported for its completion. When you look at the x-rays, you can see layer after layer after layer, mostly around the, uh, the mouth area. In the Da Vinci Code, Mona Lisa represents the union of the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. And that may be a point that we want to return to. That may not be as outrageous as it seems. Uh, the Mona Lisa, the name is an anagram for the combination of the Egyptian male god Amon and the uh, female uh, goddess uh, Isis. Uh, the Mona Lisa is also claimed to be a self-portrait by Leonardo expressing the union of his own masculine and feminine nature. Leonardo, this is his self-portrait. Mona Lisa. Leonardo and Mona Lisa <laughs> morphed together. Okay. Could be, you know, short of the age difference, could be an alternative story, okay? First, Leonardo never named the painting, much less never named, named it uh, Mona Lisa. Uh, basically, it was uh, Vasari, uh, Leonardo's biographer, who gave it a name. And most art historians aren't even convinced that Vasari had seen a picture of the, uh, of the Mona Lisa. Secondly, in terms of this goodness of fit, there's a much easier explanation to explain it. In Renaissance art, and particularly for a Leonardo, they are fascinated by the use of proportion. And again, most of those proportions fitting of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, divine proportion. But in most Renaissance art, what you'll see is that there's a shortening of the lower part of the face. So when you actually look at Mona Lisa, you'll notice that this is much shorter than you'll see in uh, contemporary art. So in contemporary modern art, you'll see an elongation of the face, but in Renaissance art, you'll see actually a, a heightening of the forehead, a shortening of the chin area. Leonardo, in his paintings, did something really interesting. He tried to put together three very powerful elements. This idealized proportion, the way the person actually looked, their actual physical appearance, and then his attempt to get uh, at their emotional expression, at the uh, essence of their uh, uh, personalities. And again, with the Mona Lisa, we actually don't know who she really was. It's supposed that he, she's the wife of Giaconda, uh, a merchant in Florence, but it really doesn't matter so much as you get to see what he was trying to do. Working with the proportion of the face, of the body, trying to give you a sense of the person and uh, emotional uh, expression, and at some level uh, to model who that real person uh, would have, uh, have been. Okay, now, away from the Da Vinci Code, done with the Da Vinci Code, hopefully, for those of you that love the Da Vinci Code, you will simply use it as the starting point to look at uh, either early Christianity or uh, Leonardo, but, uh, but take it with a, uh, a grain of salt. Please, please, please take it with a grain of salt. But what we want to do now is actually use the Mona Lisa as the code to getting into uh, Leonardo uh, himself. Again, for us, it's the mouth. It's the mouth. The eyes are interesting, but it's this mouth that is so fascinating. One explanation. Basically, when we look at the world, if we look at the world through what is called the foveal area of the eye, that is, we look at something dead center on, and you can kind of test this right now in the room, things will be very clear. But the more you move into your peripheral vision, the cloudier and more distorted things become, the fuzzier they become. Why? Because the cones in the eye are much less tightly packed in the periphery than in the uh, fovea. So, 
Mona Lisa, from an extreme peripheral point of view, look how exaggerated the smile is. From a moderately peripheral point of view, still a highly recognized smile, looking at Mona Lisa dead on, much more ambiguous in terms of the, uh, of the mouth. So it is suggested that, and this actually happened, I mean, in the times I've seen the Mona Lisa, what actually occurs is you're looking at her and she's smiling, you're looking at her again and she's kind of smirking, you look at her again and she's sad and you're going, gee, do I have a hypothalamic personality and I'm all over the map? Or, you know, is are there somebody playing tricks? I mean, it is amazing. It is captivating. Now, most people don't get to see it because they're rushing by as they're going through the loop. But if you can spend time there, it is absolutely amazing. There's a second theory, and that's a theory of visual noise, okay? That as the viewing conditions of the Mona Lisa change, as the lighting changes, as the amount of lint in the air changes, what you're going to see in that face is going to change. So there's some guys at Sloan Kettering in San Francisco who basically added different amounts of visual noise to the face. This is visual noise, you know. It's like when you put the flashlight or like the sun streams into the room and you see all this dust and you say, oh God, give me a mask. Apply it to the face. Here, she looks cheered. Change the visual noise. She looks saddened. So probably the clearest explanation takes us back to Sfumato, which is that Leonardo purposely made her mouth ambiguous, mostly by blurring the edges here and here, so that under different lighting conditions and different conditions of viewing, you would see a different face. Now, some people have argued, ah, oh, no, 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 he did, it wasn't intentional. He, uh, he, you know, basically the painting, uh, you know, has gone through all these changes. It hasn't been restored. And this is simply an accident. No, no. When you actually look at Leonardo's paintings and what is called the, uh, the Mona Lisa-esque mouth or the Leonardo-esque mouth, you know that he was working on this and that he was, in fact, able to get the effect uh, that, he, uh, that he desired. Lastly, the Mona Lisa shares with a number of other uh, great uh, portraits uh, an interesting placement on the uh, canvas. That composition for Leonardo was everything. It was huge in terms of the art that he was trying to produce. And specifically, not only as we saw the placement in the Last Supper representing the divine proportion, we also see it in the face of Mona Lisa. She sat off center, so the relationship between this side and this side is about 1.6. It starts to approximate the divine proportion. And what that tells us is that the key to Leonardo is going to lie in Leonardo's mathematics. In the notebooks, there are quite a few passages where he talks about the importance of mathematics, but perhaps the, uh, the clearest and most interesting is, let no one read me who is not a mathematician. He had a very close friend, uh, Luca uh, Pacioli, who uh, wrote some of the most famous Renaissance treatises on mathematics. In fact, Leonardo illustrated one of uh, Pacioli's books. And the work, mathematical work they did was based on something called the Fibonacci sequence, uh, named after Leonardo Fibonacci, who was from Pisa. The Da Vinci Code, for those of you that are Da Vinci Code folks, makes a lot out of the Fibonacci sequence. But it's very important for understanding Leonardo. We could spend, again, a whole lecture on, on the Fibonacci sequence, but basically it's this. You look at a set of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. Ah, they look like a bunch of numbers. But wait, if you look again, you notice something. And what you'll notice is that every figure is the sum of the two preceding figures. So 3 and 5 is 8. 8 and 13 is 21. 21 and 34 is 55. This relationship, this ratio, provides the ratio for the uh, divine proportion sometimes called the, uh, the golden structure. 
It's been known about for a long time. The ancient Egyptians used it uh, in the construction of the pyramids. Uh, the uh, Parthenon in, uh, in ancient Greece, in Athens, uh, used uh, the uh, uh, divine proportion. And as I pointed out to you, uh, so did the uh, Last Supper. So Leonardo was constantly fascinated by trying to find and illustrate and use the mathematics that was contained in the, uh, in the world. A much more fascinating discovery, by the way, about Leonardo than anything that you would find in the uh, uh, Da Vinci Code. He looked for this structure in the structures of the human face. He painted the Mona Lisa using the uh, divine proportion. The structure of her face, the structure of the relationship between her chest and the top of her head, and even the pyramidal structure of the composition itself all use the uh, divine uh, proportion. The human body is structured on the divine proportion. If we look at the fingers, okay, this is a two, this is the three, together they make a five, the three and the five make an eight. It's the Fibonacci sequence all over again. Leonardo believed that, in fact, one of the great uh, secrets of nature, that all you had to do was look, was that, in fact, nature had a mathematical order to it. This, in part, is what makes his mind such a modern mind. This is, this is a mind that any of us would be very, very uh, comfortable with today. And finally, in perhaps one of his most famous drawings, uh, the Vitruvian Man, again, he creates the structure of the human body uh, following these uh, very proportions. Leonardo's genius. This is why Leonardo is literally on everybody's genius list, and some people think perhaps there has never, ever been a genius like him before. He was a polymath. What that means, he was a person of multiple learning, many learning, polymath. But it wasn't just that he knew a lot of stuff about a lot of things. It was the depth that his knowledge went that is so impressive. And the fact that in many areas he made startling discoveries. For, for most of us, Leonardo is an artist. For most people who study Leonardo, though, art is simply one piece of who this uh, fellow was. He did original work in hydraulics, in the flow of water, making many original discoveries that were rediscovered uh, later. He was fascinated by the flight of birds and, again, uh, documented uh, avian motion and gave us tremendous insights into how uh, birds fly. He did studies in nature, both animal and botanical, uh, with copious drawings of uh, different things that one would find in nature. He um, did phenomenal work in anatomy, in dissection. Uh, he gave us some of the first drawings of the human brain and the ventricles in the brain of the human heart. He understood the, uh, the, the role that the heart played in circulation. Things that were remarkable uh, for his time. Uh, he was an architect and uh, not only planned the buildings, but planned cities, planned fortresses. Uh, he was an astronomer. Um, he uh, basically accepted, without reading Copernicus, I think, there's no evidence he had read Copernicus, the heliocentric view of the solar system, that in fact the uh, sun stayed still and the planets revolved around the, uh, the sun. And in fact he was involved in, in uh, attempts to make a telescope uh, prior to Galileo and uh, uh, was fascinated by uh, optics. He was a musician. Oh, the sound's not on. I actually have some of Leonardo's music here. But he was a musician. He designed instruments. This is, this is a, uh, uh, oops, sorry. This is a, a lyre that he uh, designed uh, made out of gold. And so he played music. In fact, Michelangelo used to call him that, that damnable lyre player. Um, <laughs> and he was wonderful at it, absolutely wonderful at it. Uh, he uh, uh, invented uh, flying machines, which uh, have actually been tested in the 20th century. His parachute worked, his glider worked, uh, and he had a remarkable uh, curiosity uh, about flight. Um, 
He rejected the biblical notion of the flood very early on and gave a very modern explanation for why one finds fossils. And if you ever want to read about that, uh, Stephen Jay Gould has written a wonderful, wonderful book on uh, uh, Leonardo's uh, archaeology. He had studies in human nature and was very interested in the relationship between the face, the body, and personality. He devised endless machines. Uh, he studied motion and, in fact, had come up with the same uh, laws of mo or laws very similar to the laws of motion that uh, Newton developed 200 years later. War machines. In fact, he used to get hired out to make uh, war machines. So, how do you explain a guy like this? How do you explain someone like this? Where does this kind of genius come from? Sigmund Freud, in his famous analysis of Leonardo, posited that Leonardo's creativity came from the fact that uh, Leonardo was a very unhealthy guy. For Freud, human creativity came from sublimation, taking our unhealthy impulses and trying to resolve them in creative activities. And for those of you that want to read about that, uh, it's in civilization and its discontents. But Freud was very curious. Where did all his energy, his fascination, his motivation come from? By the way, uh, people are still interested in Freud's explanations. This is a book by Wayne Anderson published a couple years ago that, in fact, is an attempt to rescue Freud. Uh, Anderson is an art historian. Freud basically said that the central characteristics in Leonardo's personality were, was that he had a feminine delicacy of feeling, designed cruel weapons of war, was a perfectionist and didn't finish projects, was homosexual, frigid, and had stunted sexuality, and had an unsatiable thirst for uh, knowledge. He explained this by saying, and again, uh, I could do an hour here, that Leonardo uh, uh, was a bastard. And so, he, uh, according to Freud, his father was not around. So he spent five, the first five years of his life in very, very close contact with his mother. Freud argued that, therefore, Leonardo had what is called an unresolved edible complex. What that means is that, according to Freud, what's supposed to happen for little boys is that they're supposed to fall in love with their moms, and then uh, you know they see their fathers as a threat, and they're worried that their fathers are going to cut their nuts off, and so they identify with their fathers because their fathers have been successful. And on and on and on and on. So people still write about this stuff, okay? But what happens is if that differentiation does not occur, then what happens is, one of the things anyway, is an over-identification with the mother. And for Freud, that's, oops, for Freud, that's where gay people come from. Gay people come from the fact that you over-identify with your mother, your father's not around, and therefore you seek to be like your mother, but you're in a male body, so you've got to go with other males. And uh, for a lot of people, they're not very comfortable with that, so they repress it. And so Freud argued that Leonardo then repressed his sexuality and supplemented all that repressed sexual energy into art, attempts at emotional resolution. That's why he painted androgynous characters. And science, trying to understand the nature of the, uh, uh, the world. Freud used four examples. The vulture dream the way that Leonardo misrepresented sex, particularly females, his preference for androgyny, and, of course, Mona Lisa's smile. Here's the vulture dream. And this is, this is Leonardo. He says, in the earliest recollections of my infancy, it seemed to me that when I was in the cradle that a vulture came down, opened my mouth with its tail, and struck me within upon the lips with its tail many times. Hmm, vulture, tail, mouth. Freud goes, vulture, tail, penis. Tail in mouth, fellatio. Fellatio, passive homosexual experience. Translated then becomes the desire to suck on the penis is reminiscent of the sucking on the mother's breast. But because of his identification with the mother, then fellatio becomes a way that he can offer what his mother offered him to other men. 
And of course, finally, the vulture is dramatically consistent with archetypical mythology. Because in Egyptian mythology, the vulture was the symbol for mama, literally, muta. It was called mut. Um, and it was believed that there were only female vultures and they were impregnated by the wind, which during the Renaissance, by the way, was an argument the church used to prove the possibility of immaculate conception. <laughs> then Freud goes on to show us. See? See the vulture? See? I'll help you. I'll help you. See the vulture? Could you explain that? <laughs> Not only that, he became then hung up on birds. <laughs> and my God, look at the face on that poor guy. He does not look like he is enjoying sex. In fact, he does not look like he's having a good time. In fact, if that's a woman, maybe Leonardo didn't see naked ladies. So Freud said he had very, very distorted representations of women. And there, of course, is our androgynous face. And why the mouth is so ambiguous in the Mona Lisa is Freud's, oh, I'm sorry, that was a Freudian slip, Leonardo's own ambivalence about his own mother. Here are the problems. <laughs> First, I really got very upset as I was doing this research a number of years ago. I got really upset with Freud. Most, most of his data comes from a novel. It would be, by Merzhikowski, called The Romance of Leonardo da Vinci. It was really popular around the turn of the century. It would be like you guys using Dan Brown today as a footnote in one of your papers in uh, Eric Thompson's mythology class. Don't try it, okay? <laughs> But Freud used that as a primary original source. Not only that, but you know the stuff with the vulture? It wasn't a vulture. It was a kite. And kites, oh, by the way, this is a kite. It's one of these. It's a, it's a hawk. Okay? And hence, all that stuff about vultures and Egyptians and yada, yada, yada. It's still an interesting dream, by the way meaning the bird coming down and now the kite putting its tail in Leonardo's mouth. But certainly it's not the world that uh, Freud presented. And as to that funky drawing, that's not Leonardo's drawing. This is a copy of a copy of a copy. Here's Leonardo's drawing. Okay, The body of the woman is not much better. But if you look at the guy's face, he's not so unhappy. <laughs> In fact, he's got kind of a Mona Lisa smile. <laughs> and he's got nice hair. Look at this guy and look at this guy. They're not the same guy. Not only that, but then you look at the, the rest of uh, Leonardo's sexual drawings, and you begin to see that they are very accurate depictions, given his time and what resources he had available. About two years ago, some guys in Sweden decided they would convince a couple to crawl into an MRI, a magnetic resonance machine. I don't know if you guys have been in those. They had to give the guy Viagra because the pounding was so, and he had to stay perfectly still, could not move. But basically, what he came up with, what they came up with, is almost identical to what Leonardo drew. Oops, I've got to go back the other way. Almost identical to what Leonardo drew, okay? It was amazing what he was actually able to, uh, to figure out. Rather than gross distortions in sexuality, I think one could uh, more accurately conclude that Leonardo was very interested in sex, he was very interested in men, and he was very interested in women, which then takes us to a real big problem. How do you begin to talk about homosexuality in the Renaissance? It is an unbelievably difficult topic. Um, Michael Rock is a Harvard librarian stationed in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Florence. And I remember sitting in one of my art history classes in Florence, and we we're talking about the great Renaissance artists. And you go, gee, Donatello, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raffaello, Mutant Ninja Turtles. No, gay. 
What was it about being gay and being an uh, artist in, the, uh, in Renaissance Florence? Well, it turns out, and, and again, because I'm going to run out of time, I can't give you the whole story here. But it turns out, number one, in Leonardo's time, there was no word for homosexuality. The word was sodomy. Sodomy was a term the church used, it meant contra naturum, sexual acts against nature. Women could do that. Men could do that. Heterosexual couples could do that. Okay? Um, and that, in fact, what we see is that the forms that sexuality took in Renaissance Florence were remarkable. Number one, guys didn't get married a lot. And if they did, they got married late. Uh, men between 18 and 32, only one in four of them were married. The average age of marriage was 31. And about 12% of the male population never married at all. Sodomy involved older, older men with younger men preserving male identities. Uh, there was an idealization of Greco-Roman values, and particularly male love. Women were excluded from huge numbers of the environments. The thing with the artists, there weren't women in the artist studios. It was a guy world for the most part, guys with other guys, and mostly older guys with their young apprentices. Not only that, but um, sodomy became such a problem in Florence, in fact, the German word for uh, sodomist was Florenzer, a person from Florence, <laughs> that they created something called the night offices. And the night officers um, basically went around arresting people. The population of Florence in this period of time between 1432 and 1500 was around 40,000 people. The reason it was so small, by the way, is they had gone through a set of plagues. I mean, the population had been decimated. Of that 40,000, okay, in, oops, in this period, there were um, 17,000 arrests. Now, just do some simple math. Half of 40,000 is 20,000. So maybe 20,000 women, 20,000 men, 17,000 arrests. They're arresting all the guys. <laughs> well, some of the guys they arrested over and over again, but they're arresting all the guys. There were 3,000 convictions. Leonardo himself was arrested and acquitted. Um, he was arrested for sodomy. Who knows what the meaning of that is? But I guarantee you that if you take the modern notion of homosexuality and homosexual identities and homosexual lifestyle in culture, you're going to miss the point when it comes to uh, looking at Renaissance uh, sexuality. The idea that men without homosexual identities would engage in homosexual behavior has been documented right here in Santa Rosa in a, a very famous sociological study called Tea Room Trade by Lord Humphreys. Humphreys discovered that the guys who go for blowjobs in bathrooms, more than half of them are married men with heterosexual identities. It's an interesting story how he found that out. He followed them <laughs> and asked them questions. Second is the, uh, the nature of uh, of, uh, of uh, androgynous um, uh, uh, images in the, uh, the Renaissance. Again, this book by uh, James Sassel is a phenomenal book, Ganymede in the Renaissance. But basically, uh, as you remember, the Renaissance imports a large amount of Greco-Roman uh, culture uh, and mythology. And the, uh, the myth of Ganymede that I had uh, talked about earlier uh, basically idealizes, idealizes a young man. Ganymede was a, a, a young uh, a Greek who was uh, captured by Z uh, Zeus in the form of a, uh, uh, an eagle, was ravaged, uh, and uh, this was a very, very, very popular icon in Renaissance art. Uh, Leonardo never did a Ganymede, but Michelangelo did. Most of the other great Renaissance artists did it. So, <sighs> okay, androgyny, not necessarily homosexuality. Renaissance culture is a complex, rich, varied, and oops, varied culture, very different than our own. The most famous uh, quote from Freud um, in talking about um, Leonardo is was that he was like a man who wakes too soon in the darkness while others are still asleep. No. He's a Renaissance man. He's a man emblematic, archetypically, essentially Renaissance. Leonardo 
in fact, I would argue, could not have existed outside the Renaissance. Yes, he jumped ahead in time, but only in the context of what uh, the Renaissance would allow him to do. So that's what I want to talk about now. If we're, if we're going to reject Freud's analysis, then how do we explain uh, Leonardo and Leonardo's creativity? Basically, um, I'm going to use the analysis that, um, oh, I always have trouble with this. Yeah. Sheikh Zen Mahaley uses, which is that basically, if you're going to look at human creativity, you have to look at three things simultaneously in their interactions. You have to look at the person's personality. You have to look at the domain in which their creativity exists. For Leonardo, this is going to be art and science. And you have to look at the field, the social world in which uh, their discipline or the domain exists. I'm going to broaden field because in the Renaissance it would be a mistake to talk about fields, but it does make sense to talk about the Renaissance. And so what we're going to want to look at is this relationship between the historical time and period, the specific domains where Leonardo practiced his skills, and then what we can glean, a la uh, something other than psychoanalysis, about his, uh, his history. So let's start with field. The argument is that the Renaissance, if, if Leonardo had been born in the Middle Ages, we never would have heard from him. I would argue if he had been born today, he would be domain specific. He would be doing science or art. And again, we may never have heard from him. It's this particular combination of what came together in the Renaissance. An openness for investigation that would allow him to do things like cut up cadavers. Okay? The fact that there was a patronage system that he had access to. Lots of people didn't have access to it, but he had access to it first through his father, and then because of his skills, he was very, very much in demand. Okay? The whole Renaissance definition of genius encouraged the polymath. Today, we're encouraged to specialize, 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 specialize. In the Renaissance, it was, in fact, to become a Renaissance person, a person of tremendous uh, diversity. And finally, when we look at the historical context, not only in art, but in science and mathematics, he had a platform that he was able to build from. So you cannot understand Leonardo apart uh, from the Renaissance. Talking about domain gets a little more complex. We have to actually get into the structure of the brain. What I'm going to talk about here is horribly oversimplified. I almost, dis I almost didn't you know, uh, bring this material in, except that it's critical. And why I didn't bring it in, it's not what I'm going to be telling you is wrong, it's just oversimplified. So know that, and when you go and look at split brain theory and hemispherical dominance and all that, know that it's a rich and uh, complex uh, literature. But basically we have uh, basically a right brain and a left brain, and they're connected by something called the corpus uh, callosum. In the grossest sense, the skills that we have as human beings are divided between the two cerebral hemispheres, with the left hemisphere, which controls the right side of the body, containing reason, math, language, uh, sequential uh, data, and uh, goal orientation. The right hemisphere has intuition, visual perception, music, pictures, uh, synthetic abilities, playfulness, all those kinds of, of, of qualities. The argument goes that if you're right-handed, you probably have less left hemisphere do dominance and there is a more unequal distribution of, uh, of these abilities. Okay? That's the, the crude, very crude argument. In the domain of art, one could argue that it is primarily right hemispherical. Okay? That the skills and abilities you use in art are in the right hemisphere. In the domain of science, you could argue that the skills and abilities you use are primarily in the left hemisphere. Leonardo, the argument goes, was equally developed. And in fact, perhaps what is so unique about him is that his mastery of art and his mastery of mathematics and science is almost unheard of. And the reason for that that one could perhaps uh, give has to do with his biology. 
Leonardo was born left-handed. His nickname was basically Lefty. Um, no, that wasn't the actual, it was uh, Monolito, something like that. Um, he learned to be ambidextrous, um, and he wrote backwards. He used mirror writing, which left-handed people are fairly uh, capable of doing compared uh, to right-handed people. So the argument is that because of that left-handedness, he had to develop a set of neurological structures that uh, gave him this tremendous flexibility. The other argument, because this is not a causal argument, is that uh, it wasn't the left-handedness that, uh, that allowed him to develop it, uh, but it was that he had the brain mechanisms already, uh, and it wasn't coping with the left hand, but it was actually that he had the brain mechanisms that were expressed in his uh, left-handedness. His mirror writing is something to behold. Uh, he developed a personal alphabet that is absolutely beautiful. Here's the mirror writing. Okay, so he is moving from left. <laughs> He's moving from our right over to the left. Okay, if you reverse it and put it in a mirror, you see that it is perfectly coherent and cogent writing. So it is truly uh, perfectly a mirror. Leonardo, and we'll come to this in terms of its importance, but Leonardo wrote in Italian. Most people who did scholarly work in that time wrote in Latin. And why that's important is that in part he was in the system, but in part he was out of the system. And then you translate his stuff into English. It's not easy to actually go through Leonardo's text because you have to go through all these stages. He writes backwards, you have to mirror it, it's in Italian, you have to translate it. But luckily for us, most of the codices are now, uh, now fully translated. Um, he also uh, preferred to paint with his left hand. And uh, you can see that in the analysis of his, uh, his brush strokes, which uh, move, to the, uh, move to the left. In terms of his social psychology, this is perhaps, for me, the most interesting part of this. Because when you look at the studies that have been done of creative people, one of the things they have in common is they tend to be marginal to society. There's something different about them. That's why, in fact, in the uh, psychological literature on creativity, there's so much reference to the relationship between mental disorders, particularly manic depressive and depressive disorders, and creativity. I would argue that what all the different ways that people get marge, I'm sorry, all the different things that people use as the causes of creativity have in common with each other is they have the tendency to marginalize people, okay? Leonardo, because he was born out of wedlock, because he was a bastard, number one, could not follow in his father's profession. His father was a, uh, a notary, a lawyer, for our, for our practical purposes. Um, so he went into art as an acceptable occupation. But it prevented him from going on to school, to, uh, to, to getting basically a high-level education. In fact, he used to describe himself as a man without letters. The time that he spent in Vinci was very important because it establishes his relationship to nature and the world that he saw growing up as a child. He, uh, unlike Freud's analysis, most people agree that he was not alienated from his father. In fact, he and his father had a very close connection. He lived in his father's household, and his father kept getting him work, even when he'd screw it up. His father would find jobs for him. His father found his, uh, his placement with Verrocchio, who was a friend of his dad's, and throughout Leonardo's life, until his father died, his father was always helping him out. But... So what you've got is you've got this interesting combination of a guy who is on the outside and on the inside at the same time. And that really comes through when you read his writings. He was left-handed, which in those days was considered to be a sign of the devil. Uh, Michelangelo was also left-handed and forced himself uh, to become right-handed. And finally, the lack of formal schooling. This, again, could be a whole lecture. In Renaissance Florence, the reigning philosophy was something called Neoplatonism. Again, the importation of Greek culture. 
the writings were in Latin. And what Neoplatonism emphasized was a highly idealized world. In fact, if you take a look at Michelangelo's sculptures, uh, or even the paintings in the Sistine Chapel, you look at the bodies. They're not human bodies. In fact, Leonardo used to joke. He said, Michelangelo's bodies look like a sack of nuts. And they do. They don't look like human bodies. And you, and you look, for example, in the Medici chapels in Florence, the women. The women are actually studly guys with these funny little breasts attached to them. And you're going, this is a guy who is not looking at what he is creating. Well, no. He's creating from the point of view an ideal. Leonardo's removal from that world because of his lack of education made him much more empirical. And in fact, in both in art and in his science, uh, he is probably one of the first truly uh, empirical people. Later in his life, he learned to, uh, to read uh, Latin fluently, uh, got a big library, and you begin to see the idealizations of the Platonic world uh, coming into uh, his paintings. Okay. All right, finally. Hey, I'm actually going to be able to do this. Okay, finally. What can we learn from Leonardo? I'm going to now take a leap, okay? And the leap is to suggest that the psychologist that best captures our fascination for Leonardo is Carl Jung. I spent months, literally months, on the, uh, on the uh, internet, on the web, trying to find articles that were Jungian analyses of Leonardo. I couldn't find them. Okay? I couldn't find them. It, and it's so obvious um, why he would be a prime candidate for a Jungian analysis. Jung basically developed a typology of, uh, of the self. And this is, I'm going to give, again give you a dramatically oversimplified version. But basically he said, look it, that as human beings, we can be divided into one of two types. Introverts who turn into themselves and extroverts who move out into the world. In the context of those two larger types or larger attitudes, okay, we have functions. And he said that basically as humans, we have a thinking function, a feeling function. These are called the judging functions. And we have, uh, and rational functions, and these are the, and then we have intuition and sensation which are the irrational functions, our kind of experiencing of the world. Most of us can be typed fairly simply, meaning, oh, extrovert, thinking, sensation. Okay, that might be uh, someone like a scientist. Uh, introvert, intuitive, might be an artist. And any number of combinations and mixtures of these. And for those of you that are into psych, you know, you can see what the Myers-Briggs did with all that. However, here's what's interesting for me. Jung said that there was a telos, there was a direction, there was a purpose to our psychological development. And he called that individuation. And individuation has many sides and many pieces, but one piece of it is the attempts by you and I to reconcile the opposites in our character, in our nature. And so in the idealization of uh, individuation, we would reconcile our masculine and our feminine sides. We would find a balance between our introversion and our extroversion. And finally, we would learn to be comfortable in each, each of the functions, thinking and feeling, intuition and sensing. That is to say, we would become whole and balanced people. And in the end, I would argue that perhaps one of the few people in history where we can see that is in Leonardo. And that the image of the Vitruvian man and the balance of the Vitruvian man is not only a physical balance, but a psychological balance. Because Leonardo was both an, both an introvert and an extrovert. He was both a thinking person and a feeling person. He was both a sensing person and an intuitive person. Now, if he was alive today, we could test it. But uh, as I said in the beginning, for me, Leonardo is a projective test. And those issues that I work on in my life, I look for in Leonardo. 
And like most projective tests, if you look for it, oftentimes you can find it. OK, I'm done. Thank you very much. And, and if you want to continue your studies of Leonardo, come with me to Paris. Uh, there's uh, brochures up on the, uh, the two tables.